Good morning. Welcome to Burger King. Uh, yeah, um, I'm looking at this enormous burrito, and man, I, it's big. I tell you that. Dang. Mm. Give me one of them enormouses. Enormouses. Watch out. Mm -hmm. Let's do it now. <laughs> okay, I think I know what you're ordering. Get the new Egg Normous Burrito now only at Burger King. A hearty breakfast burrito packed with sausage and bacon, plus eggs, cheese, and hash browns. Only at Burger King at participating restaurants. Love Talk Radio. Hi, this is Lee. How's it going? I, boy, so I, it's been a while since I've been in Blog Talk Radio. I used to have music, and it would play automatically. And that would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> But instead, it just started. Hang on one second. Let me just get this. The internet is so bad in Twin Falls that I have to do a blog talk radio thing because the phone service works. So hang on one second. Let's just see if these, this is working. I just got to see if this is working. It's all the boring stuff. Uh, I don't see it working. Hang on one second. Let me try this again. I'm live. Um, talk. This is horrible radio, by the way. But I got to do this, or there's really no point. And then I'll explain. There's exciting stuff going on. There's a. Uh, hang on. That's another problem here. One second. Ah. If I had music, I'd play it right now. There we go. There we go. And I don't think, normally I would, like I say, it's been months since I've been on Blog Talk Radio. Hopefully you can hear me. I don't even have any feedback mechanism. Blog Talk Radio, horrible radio here. There we go. And I'm now promoted on Twitter and Facebook. Hi, how's it going? So I thought I would do, uh, I, I was going to do Periscope. Let me explain what was going on. So I was going to do Periscope, or I was going to do Facebook Live. But literally, the Internet is so bad here. And at the hotel I'm at, at night when people use the Internet, uh, it's, it's deadly. I mean, it is like Afghanistan Internet. It is, it is that bad. It is mid-15th century Internet. Sharia Internet. That's what it is. But now, okay, so now I'm up and running. I got the show working. It was a lot of work to get it going, too, by the way. It's a lot of work, but maybe I'll be able to get things going. I might, I might start doing blog talk radio shows uh, for the next few weeks or something like that, because it is a good format. I do like it. We're going to be teaching a class on how to do it at some point, so I might as well get back into it. So let's just pretend we're starting here. We're going to start again. Ready? Uh, and, uh, pretend there's music here. I'll just go like this. Dun, dun, dun. And then here we are. And we're back. Hi, Lee Stranahan. How's it going? Blog Talk Radio. Radio Stranahan. So, <clears throat> listen, i got to be uh, – this show's only going to be about uh, 20 more minutes because I have to get up bright and early because the Twin Falls City Council is doing a city council meeting at 6.30 a.m. I'll say it again. 6.30 a.m. in the a.m., that would be the morning, 6.30 a.m., about economic development here. And so let me just give you a quick uh, recap on the Twin Falls situation. I've been up here since the beginning of August, came up here for three days a month and a half ago. And I came up here because back in the beginning of June, a five-year-old girl was raped by three – attacked by uh, – assaulted, let's say, by three refugee boys, two of them directly – uh, sexually assaulted her. And uh, that crime was, because it involved refugees, uh, was basically covered up by the locals, including the city council here. Now, there was a group of local people who were outraged by it because they'd been concerned about the refugee resettlement program prior to that. Idaho has the largest number of refugees per capita of any state in the union. It's very interesting that Idaho has been sort of selected for refugee resettlement. And then what happened was a number of things happened. Uh, the U.S. attorney, Wendy Olson, 
spoke out against the people who opposed the refugee resettlement program, more or less threatened them with legal action. Then the uh, uh, city council and the local prosecutor also said things. And so then, this is in mid-June, I got up here in August because other people, Pam Geller over at Breitbart News where I write, um, my friend Sheridan Rosenberg was a big advocate for them here, but mostly because the people here, my friend Julie DeWolf, other people here like Terry and Julie Edwards, I can name I, there's just a, a whole slew of people. Uh, and th- there's a big activist community, Laverne, Vicky. I'm just going to, I could, Glenita, I could keep naming people, but they're just names to you. But the, And there's a bunch of people I'm leaving out. And so this group of people up here has been really vigilant about this issue and has been pushing it. So I came up in August and uh, immediately – I wanted to set a factual record straight, and I realized that the refugee resettlement issue is really part of a larger issue, which is the issue we're facing in this election, which is globalization. Now, over the course of the past month or so, I've also come to realize that, look, if there's an issue in this election, if there's an idea behind the Trump campaign, and he's talked about it recently, it's this idea of populist nationalism. Let's just define those terms. Populist means it's a people-driven movement as opposed to the elites or establishment. Who's the elites or establishment? You know who they are. It's politically connected businesses. It's politicians who've been bought out by big business. It's the same thing in a sense that people like Bernie Sanders uh, and his supporters have been talking about. It's the same thing the Tea Party was talking about. Their concerns with too big to fail, right? So there's an interesting shift that I see happening in the United States, and it's looking at things not necessarily from a Democrat or Republican standpoint, but from the idea of populism. Trump is a nationalist populist, which means he is America first, right? That's just make America great again. And so in the course of this, we realize that that I, and I've been to the city council a few times now. Let's be clear about that, too. I've been to the city council a few times. And uh, the arrogant would be the word, aloof. This is why they ended up uh, covering this up, because there are companies up here, such as Chobani Yogurt, which built the world's largest, largest yogurt factory in Twin Falls. Big factory, very big factory. And uh, Hamdi Yulikaya, who's the president of Chobani Yogurt, has been the – the uh, is he the dog or the pony? I don't know. I think he's the pony. He's the pony in the dog and pony shows that Democrats do on a number of issues. He's been at the White House talking about the Gang of Eight bill, okay, the Open Borders Immigration bill. Hamdi Yulikaya is the poster boy. Let me, he's the poster – if we're going to keep the analogy going, he's the poster pony. Hamdi Yulikai is the poster pony, and the Democrats use him constantly to promote everything from gay rights to Hillary Clinton's idea. This is one of her platforms in her plank, uh, one of her platforms in her presidential run of giving companies incentive to give ownership of the company to workers. Okay? That's one of her planks. Hamdi Yulikai has. has done that. That's another story, but he's done that. Hillary Clinton did a press release about it. Hillary Clinton tweeted about it. They use Hamdi Ulikaya, and also he's a huge advocate for the refugee program. That's his number one issue. So the city council here is kowtowed by this guy, kowtowed by a pony. Let's just put it that way. They're kowtowed by a, a poster pony. If we had to sum up this episode, it would be that they're kowtowed by a poster pony. And that means that they don't want to say anything because this guy is such a big advocate for refugees. In fact, he brags that he's hired 30% of his workforce are refugees. Now, let me just – I want to phrase that another way. He's bragging that 30% of his workforce isn't American. That's what he's bragging about, right? So if he's bragging that 30% of his workforce is are refugees. He's really bragging about how many of his 
workforce aren't American citizens. And, you know, I guess we've reached a point where saying uh, what is about that is uh, you're you're called a racist, you're called every name in the book, right? So that's what's happened. And I don't believe it's racist. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying make America great again or put America first. I think plenty of other countries do it. And I think it's also about damn time we did it. And judging on the poll numbers for Trump, which are rising, I think a lot of Americans feel that way. And I think a lot more Americans feel that way than are telling it to pollsters. Because, again, when you say that, when you say you're America first, you're going to be attacked as a racist, a xenophobe, every other name that the Democrats have been calling people for 50 years. So, 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 so. Julie DeWolf and I uh, started scheming a few weeks ago, and we came up with this idea of populist na- uh, localism. Forgive me. Populist nationalism is what Trump is preaching, America first. And we're saying at a, at a city and state level, people need to start putting their own hometown first. So tomorrow morning at 6.30 a.m., and again, that's not suspicious at all. That's, that's very transparent government. The city council is meeting, and of course a bunch of the local patriots and I are going to be there participating in democracy, having our say. And they have a new head of economic development who will be there, and we look forward to meeting him. And we'll be talking to him about a couple things. He'll be talking about his economic development plans. But one thing I want to talk about is what will he and the city council be doing to assure the jobs are going to Americans first? That's my simple question. What will you do to assure that Americans are the priority of the city council of Twin Falls, Idaho? That's one issue. I'm going to tell you another economic development issue. This is one people don't talk about that much, but let's uh, we're going to start talking about it here. See, because the other thing that's happening tomorrow afternoon is that uh, Julie and I are going to have a press conference to announce our group, Make Your Hometown Great Again, which is our populist localism group. And we're going to be applying citizen activism, citizen media, to some of these issues and talking about these issues. Now, practically speaking, one of the things that's going to come up is we're going to ask not only why, how do we know the jobs are going to go to Americans, but also how do we know that new jobs that are created are going to be good full-time jobs, not 30-hour-a-week jobs. You see, because one of the things that's happened here in Twin Falls is that poverty among school children has risen in the past four years. So the city council likes to talk about all of the economic growth. Now, if you ask specific questions, well, that's private information. We can't, we can't get into company information. Okay, that's, 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 you see the way this works? Again, it's a business that, look, the dog and pony show, let's go back to that. Hamdi Ulakai is the pony, right? He's the businessman they bring out. But the politicians are the dogs, the politicians are the dogs. And they work together, and they work together for their own agenda. They work together primarily for their own agenda. And everybody knows that. Uh, Trump, Trump supporters know it. Sanders supporters know it. The question is, what do you do about it? Our group, Make Your Hometown Great Again, what we're doing about it is we are taking it on from the perspective that the Bernie Sanders supporters are wrong in their approach to solving the problem, which is they want to make government bigger, which is wacky. That's, that's, that's exactly the wrong solution. Unfortunately, that is exactly the wrong solution. What you have to do is make government smaller. There's no question that businesses are a part of this problem and a part of this equation. The Sanders supporters focus on business as the problem, and I don't agree with that. I think you need to reduce government. But you also need to open it up to more transparent government. And quite frankly, I think we can make alliances, particularly on certain issues, 
with people who are Bernie Sanders supporters or even people who are starting to realize that Hillary Clinton has hoodwinked you. Even if people – look, I don't care where you – or if you're a, a libertarian who thinks maybe Gary Johnson should have known what Aleppo was, maybe. That's not really a local issue, unless you're in Aleppo. By the way, if you're in Aleppo, it's a very local issue. And by the way, make Aleppo great again is probably a good idea. It used to be a very pretty city. I've interviewed a number of refugees from Aleppo, and now it's hell. It's been destroyed. And here's a, here's a crazy way. It's federal. I mean, it's not really local, but I'll just mention this, is possibly don't start wars that create refugees and then send the refugees into the United States. That's a crazy idea. But that's what's happened here. Look, that's what's happened here. The same politicians and business people who are in favor of open borders stuff, Hillary Clinton, John McCain, Chuck Schumer, Jeff Flake, Marco Rubio, these people, the gang of eight people, the people supporting open borders policies like Hillary Clinton, these are the same people who created the war. McCain and, and Clinton in particular helped create the situation in Syria. Right? So let's just bear that in mind. This is the way the whole little factory works. You create a war, create refugees, send the refugees over. They're cheap labor. The munitions industry is happy. Local business is – but like we've seen here, poverty is on the rise. Poverty among school children is on the rise. So the other thing I want to ask them tomorrow, aside from what are you going to do to make sure Americans get priority in the jobs, is what are you going to do to assure that these are real jobs, not part-time jobs that keep people in poverty. Don't just talk about the wages. Don't just talk about the unemployment rate. See, because what they do is they gin those numbers up, right? This is what they do. They're able to gin the numbers up on unemployment by saying, well, they're employed. Well, how many hours are they employed for? Is it something you can feed a family on? Is it sustainable? So one of our big issues is transparency, which gets back to the 6.30 a.m. meeting. What's up with that? I mean, that's, I'm curious about that. I mean, I think what they're – I think – call me paranoid. But I think what they're doing is complying with the letter of the law, right? So technically, technically, they're following the law. But – you know, are they following the spirit of the law? I don't know. I don't know. I'm skeptical. Uh, so we're going to find out. We're going to find out what's going on tomorrow. Um, I'm, you know, and by the way, it's not just going to be me. It's not just going to be Julie. It's going to be a number of people. Looking forward to it. So anyway, that's what's happening. I wanted to give you that update, talk about a few of the issues. Look, I'm not ashamed to, to go in front of the city council. And say, what are you going to do to put the local citizens first? What are you going to do to put jobs, good jobs, full-time jobs? And by the way, it's a whole other issue there, which is, of course, the, uh, Obamacare. Look, part of the reason people aren't em- getting employed full-time is because of Obamacare. Employers know that if they get above a certain number of hours, they have to kick in benefits. And this is another part of the system that just needs to be untangled. But anyway, that's what that's what we're dealing with tomorrow. So I'm going to end the show, I think. Let me see. I think I'll end the show. Let me see if I can get to it. Yeah, there we go. I'm going to end the show. I'm going to end the show. This is Lee Stranding. i got to get things organized, organized on this end. Although, I'll tell you what, though. One second. Let me just try one thing. If anyone's actually listening live and wants to call in, the number, if you want to call in, area code 619-924-0786. I'll just give that a try. 619-924-0786. If you're listening to the show, you can probably see the call-in number right now. <coughs> Forgive me, that's my Hillary hack. Oh, my goodness. It's really just a lack of water. But if anyone wants to call in right now, I'll try taking the call. I think I can do that. I think it'll 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 work. And if if no one wants to call in, I'm just going to end the show in about a minute. So 
this will be an awkward, uncomfortable minute of me hoping someone calls in. But uh, I should also mention, uh, since we're having an uncomfortable minute, speaking of uncomfortable, I am planning, not planning, I'm, in the, I'm moving up to Twin Falls right now. My family's, uh, my lease, we've been in Dallas, Texas about seven years. And uh, our lease is up in October, and we had to move someplace. Um, and we've outgrown the place that we're in. And, uh, I re- you know, I've said this before, but I really like Twin Falls a lot. And it's going to be fun at 6.30 in the morning to be with my big thermos full of Dutch Brothers coffee. Uh, it'll be fun to uh, to be able to tell them, you know, resident of Twin Falls. I'm, so, I'm sort of a, a nomadic resident right now, but that's fine. But one of the reasons I want to come up here, one of the reasons that I'm excited, excited, my wife's excited because of the weather, which and she's looking forward to snow. She's from Illinois. I grew up in Massachusetts, so I'm looking less forward to it personally. I moved away from snow for a reason, but my family's all looking forward to it, so we're, I'm sure we're going to get a little bit of snow in in Idaho. But I'm also just looking forward to to working with the people and to to. Uh, I'll just end on this note since no one's. Everyone's giving me a sad, no one's calling me. But I know I sprang this out. Oh, wait, 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 look at this. Someone on the phone. Let me let me try it. Let me see if this works. Hang on one second. Hey, this is Lee. You just barely caught me. Who's this? It's John from the Woodlands speaking of Texas. Oh, hey, how you doing? You're from, so you're from uh, near Houston, right? Yeah, just north, about 30 minutes. I've been there. I was there for the Donald Trump rally there a few months ago in the Woodlands. And I missed you. I was out of town, and that actually looked like a good one. It, uh, they didn't let it get out of hand. No, it, no, they didn't. Yeah, I was there. I was covering the protest. There was one fist fight. Um, <laughs> but, you know, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. But they kept it, they kept it to solid. What's, uh, what's on your mind? What can I do for you tonight, Sean? What's, what's going on? Well, uh you were mentioning schools this past week, and I was wondering uh, how you felt about that as being an arm of the federal government with the food programs. And was that eye-opening for you to, to see, I guess, in listening and reading that that the big point that you brought was that it extended to the entire school, that that's an eye-opener, not just the students in need. Yeah, that's exactly right. So what the, let me just get background because you, you set it up well. Let me just give some background. So the, the school, what happens is when a school reaches 40% of the students in that school are in poverty, the, the entire school kicks in to free or reduced school lunches. That's what happens. So that means at 39% poverty, the poor kids are still covered, see, because they get the, they get that program anyway, right? But if if you're a, the way I've described this is if you're a millionaire, your kid's paying for lunch. That makes sense, right? If you can afford to pay for lunch, you're doing it. But once the school reaches 40%, everybody <laughs> at that school gets the free school lunches. And it, here's what happens, and this is why it's important, because it happens and it's paid for by the federal government. In other words, if if, if two schools – in Twin Falls, suddenly get into this program. You know, people in New York and California and Florida and every place are paying for it. And by the way, same if a school in Florida, if it happens there, if they're part of this program, I don't know if Florida is, but uh, if they're part of this program, that's the way it works. And uh, but it's a it's it's a federally connected program, so I assume it's a good chance a, a place like Florida is, and if not, plenty of other states are. So, you know, one of the things we're doing with the Make Your Hometown Great thing and uh, is the way we're tackling it, education, the way we're, look, the way we're tackling a lot of these problems is we think there's too much federal involvement and even too much state and local involvement. And a part of what happens is because that program I just explained, right, it ends up being a way to funnel federal money in. So now you've got this incentive for – Corruption and this incentive for poverty. I don't know how else to put it. You're saying to the schools, hey, we'll give you all this federal money if you have more poor kids. Well, 
you know, anybody who knows anything about the way human nature works understands you've just created an incentive for poverty. So w- one of the principles that we have on our website at uh, greathometown.com is that, first off, homeschooling is a right. This is something that happened during the Obama administration where, due to a federal court ruling and due to statements by the Department of Justice, they've declared that schooling your own kids is not a right. It's a privilege, which is nuts. Whether you want to homeschool or not, uh, it's got to be established as a right. So that's one thing we're doing. And we're trying to really get um, the control back down to the parental level first, not just the town level, not the teacher level, but the parental level first. So that's part of our approach to it. But does, now, does that answer your question? It does, and I just think it I spent some years in education, and it can become a racket. I mean, look at Shivani providing the yogurt to the schools. Of, you know, that I don't think is a coincidence. So it gets no, everybody not, on a, the hook. No, that's exactly right. These big – look, when – this is – unfortunately, the Democrats and the Republicans both learned this. They learned that the the government is a big supplier of huge amounts of money, right, uh, forklifts full of money. And if you can get a federal contract for, you know, whatever, yogurt or cheese or pizzas or whatever, right, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. And it's solid money. It's steady money because the government, once you get into one of those contracts, it, it's just, you know, you're in the bureaucracy at that point. And so it is unfortunate. And the, the most disgusting thing about that school lunch program, uh, this is because of the uh, Michelle Obama inspired the Healthy Kids Lunch Program. Is how much food and is where getting wasted. Where do kids go to school? They they go they go to the Sidwell School, I think, same school Chelsea Clinton went to. Um, I'm pretty sure that Sidwell School is not on the free lunch program. But uh, this federal program that she sponsored is responsible for a huge amount of food waste, where they have to give the kids food, but the kids don't have to eat it. And so in Los Angeles Unified School District, for instance, one year they wasted, they threw away $18 million worth of food. And it's very interesting. Liberals on one hand talk about poverty and homelessness and all that stuff. On the other hand, they promote a policy that encourages waste. So uh, it, it's really horrible. Hey, John, thanks a lot for calling. Look, I really you, – you did. You caught, Just as I was about to end the show, you caught it. But uh, thanks for calling in, and now this has proven to people that you can call in. Uh, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna end the show now. I got to get my music back up on the, because you'll still still hear when I have my music, it sounds pretty impressive. But anyway, this is Lee Stranahan. Thanks, John, again for calling in. Thank you for listening. Till next time. Take care. Bye bye. Good morning. Welcome to Burger King. Uh, yeah, um, I'm looking at this enormous burrito, and man, I, it's big. I tell you that. Dang. Mm. Give me one of them enormouses. Enormouses. Watch out. Mm-hmm. Let's do it now. <laughs> okay, I think I know what you're ordering. Get the new Egnormous Burrito now only at Burger King. A hearty breakfast burrito packed with sausage and bacon, plus eggs, cheese, and hash browns. Only at Burger King at participating restaurants. Good morning. Welcome to Burger King. Uh, yeah, um, I'm looking at this enormous burrito, and man, I, it's big, I tell you that. Dang. Mm. Give me one of them enormouses. Enormouses. Watch out. Mm-hmm. Let's do it now. <laughs> okay, I think I know what you're ordering. Get the new Egnormous Burrito now only at Burger King. A hearty breakfast burrito packed with sausage and bacon, plus eggs, cheese, and hash browns. Only at Burger King at participating restaurants.